Right, so Tante, uh, Laurie Campbell, and Sikasun. I'm a two spirit Nehio, uh, Pitiko Susanasquayo, from uh, Treaty 6 territory in, in uh, Kiwitano, Saskatchewan, northern Saskatchewan area, uh, Cree Metis. And um, for those of you that haven't met me before, last year here on campus, um, I'm sort of relocated. It's still pretty new, it's just been over two years since I've been out here in uh, Mohawk uh, territory. And, um, and uh, yeah, so I've been out here for just, just over two years now. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, indigenous research paradigm is kind of, I kind of went with areas that I'm working on right now and, and some of my own work in revisiting. And, um, and then Amina, who's a student over here, is going to share a little bit about her work, which I thought um, I'm, I'm uh, involved in Amina's work and uh, have been working with her through her process. And I thought there's some things that she might also be able to share just in the, a little bit about the work she's doing that... Uh, Hopefully you'll see kind of how some of this threads through and you might see how some of it might be relevant or things to consider in the kind of work that uh, you're taking up in your projects. So but before we start, I do uh, want to acknowledge that we're um, situated on the traditional territories, original territories of uh, neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Um, and uh, the, the particular sort of treaty area we're on is the Haldeman Tract, which includes um, land uh, on six, mi six miles on either side of the Grand River. Um, that's a promise to the Six Nations. And um, it's important, I think, to uh, always uh, acknowledge uh, the territory and the land that we're on because it's an opportunity to make visible, um, you know, Indigenous peoples uh, historically and presently who, um, and historically certainly, who are the original caretakers of the land, but also who still contemporarily uh, in these regions. Um, and, uh, and, and obviously our in, in, uh, you know, in, the, in this nation currently known as Canada has not been, um, has, has gone to great lengths to uh, erase Indigenous peoples. And so um, I think that's one reason why it's important to do that. Um, I also want to bring up as well where I'm from is uh, the Indigenous peoples there are very different uh, than the Indigenous peoples here. And so where I'm from in Saskatchewan or throughout Saskatchewan we have uh, the Cree, um, we do have Anishinaabe, uh, but we also have uh, Soto, uh, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota uh, peoples, and, and also uh, Métis peoples there as well. And there's great diversity amongst the indigenous groups. And so that is something that uh, you will be need to think about if you're going to be engaging with indigenous people or indig in indigenous territories um, that... Uh, uh, even what I'm sharing here today is certainly not going to be a one size all and you will need to engage specifically with whichever group and territory that you're working with to find out protocols and what's appropriate. Um, although there will be some sort of common things, themes that I'm going to share here today. Oh yeah, I was going to change that picture. I was working on my presentation. I didn't know what to put on this slide, but um, I just, I just want to, um, I guess I kind of situated myself there a little bit um, uh, as I was just speaking. Um, I will also add in there, I'm uh, originally when I started out in post-secondary, I took um, my first degree as a Bachelor of Arts in Indian Studies. And so uh, it tells you how old it is. It was actually a degree that was called Indi Indian Studies, which now is, has uh, morphed into, um, actually morphed into probably Native Studies for a while and now is more commonly known as Indigenous Studies throughout our post-secondary institutions. Uh, and then I completely did another separate undergrad degree. Uh, in psychology, but I did a completely separate undergrad degree because I didn't think Indigenous peoples went to graduate school. And so, um, but I wanted to keep going to university, so I thought the way to do that was to do another undergraduate degree. Certainly by the time I finished that, I realized that yes, indeed, there are Indigenous people in grad school, maybe not many, but uh, um, they were there and, and our numbers are growing, and so I went back and um, did my master's in adult education and that's where I really started to focus and learn about Indigenous research methodologies and what that means um, and, uh, uh, in my work and in, in the works of, works of my peers. Um, and, and now I'm working on my PhD in social justice out of, out of uh, OISE. And, and I've spent um, half of my coursework actually really sort of intentionally looking at research and ways in which research has um, caused harm and the ways in which sometimes we're implicated through the work that we're doing or, or through our work in the institution that implicates us in causing harm. 
and uh, thinking about ways that we can do research different to, so to minimize harm. So what I wanted to start off with is um, a story. And uh, you'll see throughout some of the slides that I have, I'm going to refer to Sean Wilson's book, Research's Ceremony. Um, this was actually the book that I uh, picked up in my first, uh, in my master's program uh, on Indigenous research. It was the first sort of book I picked up next to uh, one that Amina brought here, which is Linda Tuiwa Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies. Now, this book, original book, this is a second edition, um, came out 20 years ago. And then there was a very long gap, and, and Linda's um, over, over in um, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand. And um, there was a big gap that was like kind of really foundational on looking at indigenous research methodologies. And then over here in Canada and Australia and New Zealand, then and through it's more books started being published. But it was, there was uh, quite a gap, and, and so around 2005, 2008, uh, Sean's book came out in 2008. Indigenous started publishing about um, in an academic setting about indigenous research methodology. So Sean was the second book that I picked up, and. Um, it's still kind of like one of my go-tos, and I've given out probably a dozen copies of the year students um, who come into my office. But there's a story that's shared in here at the beginning of the book by um, Heather Harris, and uh, she had done it, written it in 2002. And um, she's in our tradition. We have we have uh, a character that we sometimes refer to as Coyote, and um, that particular character is. We use them in stories to like teach us lessons or morals or um, uh, it, it, he's a teaching character in our stories in, in which we learn from. Um, and so she's written a story called uh, The Paradox of Indigenous Higher Education using Coyote as sort of the central figure and as the teaching tool. Um, when we use Coyote in stories, it's, it's helping us to think um, to sort of think outside ourselves and interpret things from another point of view also. And so she uses that within this particular story. So she's in this story to help us think about research. So I'm going to share the actual story with you. <clears throat> so she says, Coyote was once again fed up with running around all day in the hot sun for a few scrawny gophers and rabbits. Dirt up his nose, dirt in his eyes, and what for? Barely a mouthful. Coyote had tried getting food at the supermarket one time, like the human people do, but got the shit kicked out of him for doing that. So once again, he went to his brother, Raven, to ask him for advice. Coyote said, Raven, there's got to be an easier way to get fed. I tried the supermarket, got beaten up. I tried to get money from welfare, but came up against the devil's spawn in the Kmart dress. Nothing worked so far. You've got any other ideas? Well, Raven said thoughtfully, the white humans seem pretty well fed, and they say that the key to success is in good education. Maybe you should go to school. Hmm, Coyote mused. Maybe I'll try it. It couldn't hurt. Well, Coyote, he went off to school. He went off to the university, because that's where Raven said adults go to school. In a few days, Coyote was back. Well, my brother, Raven inquired, did you get your education? Not exactly, Coyote replied. Education is as hard to get as a welfare check. To get an education like the teachers at the university, you have to take at least 10 years. And that's a Coyote's entire lifetime. And in the end, you don't get paid much anyways. When I got to the university, they asked me what program I was in. I didn't know, so they sent me to this guy who told me about the programs. I kind of liked the idea of biology. If I learned more about gophers, maybe they'd be easier to catch. I liked the idea of engineering. Maybe I could invent a great rabbit trap. But in the end, I settled on native studies. Now that's something I can understand. I've known these guys for thousands of years, even been one when it suited me. So I went to my Introduction to Native Studies course, and can you believe the teacher was a white guy? Now, how much does that make sense? I saw Native people around town, 
any one of them has got to know more about the native people than the white guy. When I asked this guy what Indian told him, the stuff he was saying, he said none. He read it in a book. Then I asked who the Indian was who wrote the book. And he said, it wasn't an Indian. It was a white guy. Then I asked him what Indian the guy who wrote the book learned from, and the teacher got mad and told me to sit down. The next day, I went to my Indians of North America class. I was really looking forward to meeting all those Indians. And you know what? There was another white guy standing up there and not an Indian in sight. I asked the teacher, are we going to visit all of the Indians? He said no. So I asked him, how are we going to learn about the Indians then? And he said, just like the other guy, from a book written by a white guy. So I asked him if I could talk to this guy who wrote the book, and the teacher said, no, he's dead. By then I was getting pretty confused about this education stuff, but I went to my next class, Indian Religions. And guess what? When I went in, there wasn't another white guy standing up at the front of the room. There was a white woman. I sat down and I asked her, are we going to the sweat lodge? No. The Sundance? No. The UEP? No. Then how are we going to learn? No. Wait, I know, from a book written by a dead white guy. I'm starting to get the hang of this education business. So then I go to my research methods class thinking I've got it figured out. In this class, the teacher, you've got it, another white guy, said that our research must be ethical and we must follow the guidelines set out by the university for research on human subjects. The rules are there, my teacher said, to protect Indians from unscrupulous researchers. Who made these rules, I asked. You guessed it, a bunch of white guys. They decided we need protecting and they were the ones to decide how best to protect us from them. So I told my teacher that I wanted to interview my father. The teacher said, well, you've got to ask the Ethics Review Committee for permission. What? I've got to ask a bunch of white guys for permission to talk to my own dad? That can't be right. And I was confused all over again. So I sat down and thought about all of this for a long time. Finally, I figured it out. If a white guys teach all of the courses about Indians, and they teach in the way white people think, then to find Indians teaching in the way Indians think, all I had to do was give up Native Studies and join the White Studies program. So we have a long history in this country of, of um, history and contemporary reality being written by um, not uh, an indigenous community or, or most racialized or marginalized groups by people in power and privilege who are talking about us. And uh, certainly research um, on, in, was more on indigenous peoples, um, came out of you know, fields like anthropology where we were being studied to document us, to preserve us into the future because we weren't supposed to exist and this would be a record of us so that one day they could look back on us and, and talk about what they learned about us. Um, a lot of it's obviously moved out of that field and, and we have indigenous people who have taken up uh, uh, research ourselves. A lot of research also has caused harm to indigenous peoples by um, perpetuating myths and stereotypes, lack of understanding of settler colonialism, uh, policies of assimilation, of, of um, uh, you know, people having opportunity to even realize uh, their role or responsibilities within treaty agreements, um, all of those sorts of things. So what I'm going to talk about moving forward is thinking about a research paradigm and what do we know or what do we think about when we think about a research paradigm. I'm also going to have to check my clock periodically because I don't see one in here. I want to kind of keep us somewhat on schedule. So I really struggled actually, like when I was an undergrad in my psych, I remember I, like I had to take a research methodology class and um, like I really struggled. I didn't understand it. I didn't relate to me. I couldn't, um, it was quantitative, probably, you know, um, probably, you know, significant of the field I was in, which was psych at that time. 
And again, I also just felt like it wasn't a place for me. And so when I did get into grad studies originally, I was like really dreading this notion of having to take another research methods class. And um, it wasn't until um, I realized that there was an indigenous research methodologies class and I started uh, learning about that, that um, I actually really felt like there is a place uh, for me and the way I think and the way I understand things to be a researcher and to do this kind of work. But um, four very important things when we're thinking about research are, are ontology, uh, epistemology, methodology, and axiology. So ontology is thinking about like what is real or what is my reality, right? So what is my truth? What is it that exists as, as my, the realness in my world? And epistemology is thinking about like how do I know what is real? So it's the nature, uh, the study of the nature of thinking or knowing, and it involves theory of how it is that we come to have knowledge or how it is we come to know what it is that we know. And epistemology includes things like an entire um, systems or ways of thinking or cognitive uh, ability to, to come up with how it is that it, we know what we know. <clears throat> What we believe to be real is going to be impacted by how we think about reality. Okay, so these are all going to tie together. So our methodology, thinking about like how is knowledge gained? How do I find out more about this reality, this reality that I have? Um, the theory of how knowledge is gained and the science of like how do I find out these things? So one way of looking at it is thinking like, reality is, or ontology, what our reality is, and how we know this reality, our epistemology, impact the ways more knowledge can be gained uh, about this methodology or about this reality. So a sort of, um, let's see here an example. So if I, if I think if my, if my um, reality is, or my ontology is that I think um, Let's say I think uh, poverty is real. There are poor people um, in our cities. Uh, and so if I think that's a reality, or that's real in my world, and how do I know this is real? Well, you know, I, 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 I see it. Um, I have sort of assumptions about it, um, what's informing me. If I don't think, as far as methodology, um, if I don't think that, um, settler colonialism or policies of assimilation have anything to do with the disproportionate number of indigenous peoples in this country living in poverty, if that's not my reality of what I know or believe, I'm not even going to think about that while I'm doing my research project, or it's not going to be valid. I would be looking at other things that inform what it is my reality is. So it might be things about maybe it's just the job market, maybe it's... Um, education, access to education, you know, there might be all these other, other things without thinking about some of those deeper levels because that doesn't inform my belief system and how I formulate what my reality is. So the axiology is, is also thinking about then like the worth of the knowledge. So what part of this reality is worth finding out more about? So if um, assimilation uh, uh, government policies aren't part of my reality and aren't something that I'm going to think about in my work um, and I don't think that's a real thing, then I'm not going to be go there and I'm only going to have a certain idea and beliefs that drive me the way that I'm going with my research. <clears throat> when we're thinking about uh, axiology and, and worth of knowledge, I'm thinking about what is it ethical to do in order to gain this knowledge? Um, what will the knowledge be used for? So it's the ethics or morals that guide the search for knowledge and judge which information of, is worthy of searching for. So one's view of reality will be reflected in what knowledge is worth seeking out in order to under, better understand our reality. So it comes together in a whole package, and that would be something that we would call a research paradigm. In, if you, I'm, I don't know you know, what exposure or thought uh, folks have had, and, and uh, really this is a sh small synopsis of something that is easily, um, like I said, I've taken three sort of research classes uh, over this last year looking at different aspects of this. 
But it's kind of a brief synopsis of, of the ways that uh, we're thinking about things. But, um, but the research paradigm is all of those things together. And a Western, Western um, ideas often uh, models have us uh, in research, you know, kind of have us separate things from the whole and look at little parts and kind of dissect things in a lot of ways. Um, indigenous research paradigm focuses on the whole. You cannot take out and isolate things. So we cannot look or think about um, ontology, epistemology, methodology, or axiology without thinking about the whole picture and how one informs the other. And I will speak a little bit more about that. <coughs> There's a couple of key concepts in philosophy, um, which is what I'm talking about today, is indigenous philosophy. Because our philosophies and our underlying beliefs or understanding inform what it is that we do and how we go about it. And so it's hard to think about um, understanding or doing work with indigenous peoples unless you take some time to understand indigenous philosophy, ways of thinking, ways of engaging uh, in the world and relationship to the world around them. Two very, very key things in um, indigenous, whether, whether it's research or just ways of being, are concepts are relationality and relational accountability. So relationality is like thinking about like relationships, like, like the relationship doesn't shape the reality, but the relationship is the reality. It's like that piece of what's like in between you and I that is most significant. That's the piece that we're trying to care for and to think about is how do we keep that, that in good. Because separate, without that piece in between us, I'm just me and you're just you. But there's that relational piece that, um, you know, you could almost think like, um, like we exist in relationship. That's the only way that it can be. And not just with each other as humans. We think about that, and I'll explain this a little bit more uh, later, but in the world and environment around us as well. So looking back at epistemology and ontology, we're thinking about how they are based upon relationality. So, and from uh, the epistemology and ontology, indigenous axiology and methodology sort of emerged, and they're based on what we call relational accountability. So often in research, bringing it back to research, we're thinking about like trying to find something that's like right or wrong or statistical difference or um, validity. Uh, you know, some of, the, some of those terms might be coming up. Um, but in an indigenous paradigm, uh, those types of things aren't valued as much as the meaningfulness and the obligation of the research relationship itself. So that end result which is, is really challenging when we work in academic settings, you know, because oftentimes that end result is what's going to get us our grade, what we need to submit. And that's important um, in, in that aspect, but that's not necessarily the most important piece of the work that we're doing when we're engaging with Indigenous peoples and doing work in Indigenous community. So the researcher, unlike also like many Western paradigms that will have us think that we need to be objective and sort of... Um, outside of, you know, not to contaminate uh, the, the community or the people that we're working with. Um, that is, uh, like, that, that's actually, like, essentially, like, unethical in working with Indigenous peoples or doing uh, research with Indigenous peoples, right? Um, because that relationship and the relational accountability is so fundamental to uh, work that um, to not do that would probably give you... Um, uh, ran out of town pretty, pretty quick. It, it's, it's just not going to go very well. But there's also this notion that I have an accountability to be engaged in that process as the researcher um, in a different way, in that relationship, and taking care of the space in between us. That's significant and important. The researcher has a vested interest in the integrity of the methodology, um, being respectful, and the usefulness of the results if they are to be of any use in indigenous community or if there's going to be some sort of reciprocal agreement. So the ethics of how we're engaging with research is um, there's more to it than just being the researcher, just being the 
person who comes in to uh, do the research. So that brings me to something commonly called the three R's in um, Indigenous research um, paradigm. So the three R's are respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. So these can be kind of thought of as like characteristics of the relationship that you're going to be potentially entering into, if that's what you're choosing to do. So when we think about respect, I'm not just you know, speaking about sort of the you know, everyday respect that you know, generally we give one another of, you know, hi, how are you? But you know, I don't really want a whole conversation. And I just want to say, hi, how are you going on the hall? And I just want to hear fine, and that's it. Um, you know, please and thank you. Um, those are important too. I mean, I'm not saying that we don't want to throw those out the window, but, but um, we're looking at um, the respect um, that really, uh, we have a Cree word for it, uh, um, thinking about a basic law of life, and that regulates like how we interact within our entire environment and ecosystem around us. There's also, um, this notion in, in our philosophy that uh, um, humans as people, like we're not, we're just a part of the picture. We're no better than or no less than um, anything that's around us, the earth, the grass, the animals, the insects. Um, we're just a part of that. We're not here to dominate. We're not here to leave our imprint upon um, what is around us in the environment. We're here to exist within, within that realm. When we're doing research and engaging in those relationships, it means that we're thinking um, or listening intently to understand and that we're not trying to impose our um, ideas or our, um, where we're wanting to head or our agenda into the research. Okay? And reciprocity is, you know, again, it's sort of that one extra step. It's not, it's not just about giving a gift, although, um, you know, gift giving, um, in protocols are important in some of the context of how you may do work, but it's about, again, about that um, peace with, with in between us in that relationship. And the reciprocity might also look like I have an obligation because I'm funded through a research grant through the university to do some work and I have a, um, a commitment to publish a certain academic paper for the university to meet sort of the goals of that. But you, as the community, indigenous community that I've done research with, um, what is it that you might want from me? And so you might, I might have to also like write that paper in an academic way to, for the institution, but I might also need to write it in a community report way that community members can read and understand and apply what it is that we've you know, learned together on our work together. So, in some ways, it might seem like um, maybe twice the work compared to um, other work that might be done in the academy. Um, it could be that uh, a re as a researcher um, that you might be called upon to access uh, spaces that you have the privilege of accessing to share information that uh, you've learned together with that community about the work you're doing. So maybe you have a platform or a space that you can get into and the community has now asked you to go take that information forward and get those people to listen to you so that we can you know, do what it is that we need to do or get the resources we need to do. Um, you, uh, it's, not, it's not autonomous. You're not, you're not autonomous, you're not an individual when you enter into this type of research and if you're thinking um, in this mindset. <clears throat> um, and uh, responsibility, there's a, there's a um, you know, not just a responsibility to do ethics in the way that we need to within the institution, but a responsibility to the community that you're working with. Um, that you will um, do things in a good way, that you will um, be working with them um, in a good way and, and not, uh, not doing things in sort of unilaterally and, and for your own benefit or own achievement. It's about thinking about um, another way to look at it. And, and this, is, this is still done, uh, but certainly was more done historically. So like if you're, if you're thinking about your project and you're actually just going to find an indigenous person to extract all this knowledge from them that you can like do your project, um, that's, those are really the types of things that we're moving away from because what, how is that um, 
where's the respect and reciprocity and the responsibility within that? Where's the relationship? Where's the relational accountability? Um, <clears throat> so those are some things to think about. There's also um, a little while later, uh, fourth hour kind of got thrown in the mix too, called uh, uh, called uh, relevance, and um, and so that's uh, you know it is also quite important. And then thinking about uh, what, as a project is being built together, what is the relevance? If there's no relevance, if you have a certain skill set and you're coming to meet with the community, you know you may offer your skill set, which may be an amazing skill set and uh, a resource you can offer them, but it may not be something that's relevant to that particular community. Maybe their infrastructure is fine and they don't need, you know, whatever expertise you're bringing in that area. And so, um, so it's not relevant to them. So, you know, you don't, uh, again, not driving your own agenda to try and do this project in this location because this is all my budget's for. It only send me 200 miles north. I can't go 400 miles north or all those types of things. So thinking about what's, uh, what's driving the work. In a not so abstract form, I put together, I didn't put together. These are, um, I took these out of Wilson's book. So some of the things that I've been talking about, if you want to think about it in a little bit more of a concrete form, these are some questions um, that Sean's asking you to think about and that I try to think about in the work that I do. So, and I can make my PowerPoint available if folks are interested. But um, so how do my methods help build respectful relationships between the topic that I am studying and myself as a researcher? Um, how do my methods help build a respectful relationships between myself and the other research participants? How can I relate respectfully to other participants involved in this research so that together we can form a stronger relationship with the ideas that we will share? Is my role as researcher in this relationship and what are my responsibilities? And not, again, not just the responsibilities to the funder or the institution or wherever you do, or corporation and company you're doing the work for, but to the community, to that relationship. Um, am I being responsible in fulfilling my role and obligations to the other participants, to the topic, or to all of my relations? What am I contributing or giving back to the relationship? Is the sharing, growth, and learning that is taking place reciprocal? Or is it feeling like it's really a one-sided relationship? And we've all had those, and they're not fun. They're not good. <laughs> I kind of uh, focused in on three different um, things to consider that might be different and things that I've come across um, um, in ethics. And when we think about ethics, that's uh, um, it's always a, seems like kind of a scary thing to do in the, like submitting for that ethics approval. Um, there's, there's so much uh, information wanted and, and, and trying to get that form right and get everything in the right spot. Um, as I, you know, thinking about our Western paradigm, we're often thinking about um, ways in which you know, we're removed from the work that we're doing and, and perhaps even um, maybe not so much in, in your field of work but uh, potentially about keeping anonymity of participants, um, uh, those types of things. In some ways, in many ways, like that anonymity is, goes against indigenous ethics of engagement. Um, it's important to recognize the relationship and so you know, you may need to think differently about this. And, and as you get into community, like these are conversations that you'll need to have uh, with the community that you're working with or with the rest of your research team if, if you're working in a mixed uh, research team. <clears throat> There's also often an added layer of ethics because many indigenous communities uh, or governance bodies or um, uh, organizations have their own ethics that they've developed as well within their community. So, um, so you may have to do an ethics for the university, and then you may have to do another ethics for the community. And they may be, um, there will probably be some similarities and some that I've seen, but there also may be lots of different um, differences in that. Um, so again, it may seem like you're doing the work, and really you are, but that's the nature of this kind of work. Um, another like challenge I find is often... Um, if you're having to go for that university ethics, you know, you kind of like need to like map everything out for them, but you may not have had the opportunity to really like be engaging with the community, right? Because you don't have ethics approval yet. So um, it kind of is 
really challenging and it may require you to go back and change um, your original ethics approval based on what is learned and what becomes community driven from your work there, right? Because you might have an idea that we're going to do, I don't know, a survey, you know, and, and so you, uh, you submit your ethics and, you know, this is what you're doing as, as, a, as a method, a tool you're using, and then you get to community and it's like, well, no, we really, like, we don't want to do a survey. That's uh, not important or relevant for us. We actually want to have, you know, focus groups or talking circle or, you know, these other things. And, uh, and you may need to go back and um, adjust your uh, mainstream ethics in order to reflect that. But it's about, um, but that challenge is, you know, our, um, the work isn't sort of unilateral, unilaterally driven by the researcher. It's done in community. And so the ethics um, back and forth can be a little bit longer. And in fact, um, my master's was actually a year back and forth. And I ran into some of those similar problems like a Coyote spoke of in his story. My mom, it was on the lived experiences of my birth mom. And my mom like, why can't I start, like, why can't you just start recording this? You know, who are these people that are making this decision that you can't, you know, we can't talk about this topic right now while we're, you know, having tea. And um, it was really challenging for her to um, understand. And uh, being an earlier, earlier on researcher too at the time, it was challenging for me to sort of navigate that. I think, um, when I think about all this, I think that uh, the research in a lot of ways like creates itself. There's this process, this relationship, the relational accountability that's growing as you're doing it. That's part of it. That's part of the work. Um, and that's one of the things that is oftentimes quite different from our Western uh, paradigms of ways of doing research, where the end result is really what we're looking for. Results, what's the outcome? What are we going to be able to do to um, change this, make this different, make it better, um, solve this problem? It's actually that in between, everything that's happening from when you uh, reach out to the end point, that all that in between is the most valued piece in there. Um, I noted that the research emerges through relationality and relational accountability and is woven within the fabric of the respect, responsibility, and reciprocity. So Wilson in his work argues that uh, using an indigenous perspective is not, doesn't necessarily mean that you're using an indigenous research paradigm. So I would say certainly in my master's work, I was, although I was learning indigenous um, research methods and I was uh, bringing indigenous perspective, I wasn't looking at um, that whole picture of how um, my ontology, epistemology, um, methodology, and axiology all fit together and complete to build a complete uh, indigenous research paradigm. Um, and Wilson argues that in order to really have an indigenous paradigm in our work that we need to think outside of Western models altogether. We can't take a piece of a Western model and try and insert some indigenous perspective in it if we're going to operate from an indigenous paradigm. Um, because in the same way in an indigenous paradigm our underlying beliefs and how we know what we know and what stories tell stories. You can think in a way of like what stories tell stories, what, um, what knowledge informs our knowledge. And um, we all have, based on our cultural backgrounds, our regional you know, cultural backgrounds, um, uh, all of those different types of things have underlying beliefs that inform all of those pieces. And so I could be um, uh, you know, using a, an indigenous perspective, but it's still the underlying belief that of something that might be coming from a Western model if I'm just trying to insert sort of over top. That's not to say there's not room for mixed methodology or, or um, any of those types of things. And I would say in, in a lot of ways, I still do a lot of mixed methodology. Um, but this is really thinking about the philosophy of indigenous research paradigm. Um, as I mentioned, the, the combination is greater than the sum of its parts and, and uh, the entirety is a paradigm and one cannot be separated from the other. And these beliefs, again, will influence the tools that we use as researchers. So 
using a dominant research paradigm and trying to adapt it to our way of understanding the world or inserting our perspective into the dominant worldview does not particularly work because the underlying beliefs cannot be entirely removed from the tools that we may use. <clears throat> I think we can also, um, because of the work that indigenous scholars um, and non-indigenous scholars have done in relation to indigenous scholars before, us, I think we can you know, also start letting go of the notion that um, of comparing indigenous research methodologies or indigenous paradigm to Western paradigm or looking for validity of indigenous research or ways of being and knowing by validating it in Western ideology. Um, there's they're different, and it's okay. There's lots of different things. And um, we don't need to validate one within the other because in that way, we're losing some of the essence of the work that we're trying to do or the ways that we're trying to think. Oh, I know, I was gonna put a diagram on that slide. That's why there's like nothing on that slide other than the title. I forgot. And uh, to sort of sum up where, uh, um, all that I'm going to speak about here today. I, thinking about knowledge, and I know, like, certainly in my mainstream schooling, like, a lot of times, um, knowledge, we think about it as, like, being, like, an individual entity. Like, we want, even in our school, in the university, right, it's competitive, like, the best mark. And so um, sometimes that puts us in competition with each other or reluctant to share a piece because we want that particular award or it's the way the system is set up. So is often individual. Um, we uh, don't want to share it until, for fear somebody else might steal it and publish it or, or do something different with it. Um, versus thinking about the ways uh, in which knowledge is relational or knowledge um, is responsibility. So oftentimes we're taught that knowledge is power and um, in order to have that, some people can't have, in order to have the power, some people can't have the knowledge. So somebody has to be sort of a gatekeeper of that knowledge. In indigenous culture, when we think about knowledge as being responsibility, um, every time I, I learn or one of my elders, you know, calls me and says, you know, well, I'm going to, I've got to come, got to meet, I want to, you know, you need to learn this. It's like, it's like, oh, like it's like, it's responsibility it's, it's, uh, to have that knowledge that is being shared with me means that I have to conduct myself in a certain way. I have to carry that knowledge. I have a responsibility to pass on that knowledge um, and to take care of that knowledge. And, and uh, it's a responsibility. It, it's, um, it's hard work. It's hard work to be in that place. Um, And Wilson talks about knowledge being relation, relational and how it's shared with all, uh, all of creation. And we have this uh, uh, philosophy that, you know, that we're responsible to all of our relations and that is everything around us in, in the natural world and in the spiritual world as well. Um, uh, one of my most favorite um, statements comes from Graveline who writes, that which the trees exhale, I inhale, and that which... I exhale, the trees inhale. And so it speaks to that symbiotic relationship that exists. And we need everything that is around us. And um, I know very little um, about your field of study. What little I do know is uh, from Amina, who's doing some amazing uh, work, and I'm learning so much um, about it. But um, I also, I just really felt like that quote in the kind of work and projects that you will be taking on in your profession is really important to think about the relationship to what's around and in the environment and the natural world and in the communities that you'll be doing work. What did I put? And another one of my favorite Wilson quotes. I just stuck to Wilson. Amina brought a whole bunch of other books which are also very brilliant. But I kind of stuck to Wilson because I was kind of th rethinking through this myself um, uh, and his work. But um, if research doesn't change you as a person, then you probably haven't done it right. And that's 
And that's you know, very much in line with an indigenous research paradigm. That's not for all research. And doing work, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, uh, um, not everybody, in order to be a good friend or ally, needs to take up your research with and engage with indigenous people in the indigenous community. That's not, uh, that's not sort of the end goal of what everybody needs to do. Um, but um, for those of you that are interested and are thinking of, of you know, pursuing that, there's, what I'm trying to present is that there's some philosophy and background learning that is really important to think about um, in order to enter into those relationships because otherwise the understanding of even what's happening in your conversations in community, uh, there'll be a gap there in understanding why things are being done or requested in the way that it is that they're being done. Um, and of course, Sean's book, um, his title is Research is Ceremony. And he says towards the end of his book that research by and for Indigenous peoples is a ceremony that brings relationships together. And in a holistic way, the work that, um, that we're trying to do is about building those relationships in a good way, in a positive way, so that we can work alongside each other, with each other, um, without uh, either uh, indigenous or non-indigenous people sort of dominating or driving the agenda of each other. And how do we find that space? How do we hold that space in the work it is that we're doing? I will leave it at that for my part. Thank you. <laughs>